with Steve Bomo. He's known for the World Atlas of Beer. He's the author of seven editions of Good Beer Guide Belgium, a camera book of Belgium Triple Offer, Brussels and Belgium Offer, Good Beer Guide Belgium, Netherlands and Belgium Offer. He co-wrote the first edition of Lambicland. He lives in Bristol, UK. Welcome, Tim Webb. How are you doing? Uh, well, considering it's lockdown, I'm not doing too badly, Dieter. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, tell me a little bit. Um, how do you start as a beer journalist? Well, I started. I actually started as um, a beer campaigner. I was with the campaign for Real Ale from when I was very young. Uh, for the first few years, I was just uh, a regular local member. I would go to beer festivals, drink some beer, etc. Then a few things started happening with our local breweries that were very bad, and I became more active. And I eventually joined the national executive of Camera. And th then I started getting into the publishing and writing side of things and did a bit of writing myself. And it, it took off, but the big, the big thing that changed was that just as I was getting to the end of my time with Camera Nationally, we commissioned a book called, uh, it was going to be called The Good Beer Guide to Belgium and Holland. Uh, and we got a manuscript for it. And it was appalling. <laughs> it was really bad. And uh, so as I was retiring from the national camera scene anyway, I said, look, I'll, I'll write it. And that became the first uh, Good Beer Guide Belgium Holland back in 1991. And things started to build from that. And then it became a hobby that got out of hand. Yeah. All right. Uh, tell me a bit, as a camera member, how do you start writing about Belgian beer? What's so special about uh, Little Belgium? <laughs> well, if you think back, uh, well, not think back, but if, let me assure you, back in the 1970s, uh, that was when camera really started. And the other thing that started at roughly the same time was the writings of Michael Jackson. And Michael first discovered beer, as it were, in Belgium. And he, he wrote The World Guide to Beer in 1977. And that was the first book I was aware of that gave Belgium some really big prominence. I decided the best way to find out about it was to go and discover Belgian beer, uh, which I did in a place called Amsterdam. <laughs> and um, I had a, a memorable trip to Amsterdam with uh, some friends, where in the Golem Bar, uh, we spent quite a lot of hours and I discovered maybe a dozen beers of a type I'd never come across before. Uh, so then I decided to go back and try them in, I think it was Antwerp, uh, and it grew from there. And if you are young and enthusiastic and you've discovered something that you think nobody else knows about, well, you do start to write about it. And because I was in camera, there was some opportunities to write just articles for local magazines and some, some for the national magazine. So it kind of built up from there. But it was really, I can honestly say that the day I drank a lot of Belgian beers in the Golem Bar in Amsterdam was the day I got converted to Belgian beer. And it's really gone backwards ever since. It's been ruined my life and uh, or at least shaped my life. Um, and it's been a, um, well, a mix of a hobby, an interest and something which is now a pretty profound study, I think. Yeah, yeah indeed. Um, what was your background? Were you something with uh, literature or, or journalism? No. 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 I was um, back in those days, I was a medical student. I became a doctor. Uh, I worked for our National Health Service. I was actually quite senior. I became a, a senior consultant, a medical director, and things like that. And I worked for the health service up till 2010 uh, when I half retired. And um, it had an impact on all the stuff I was doing with beer because I felt there was a clash between what my day job was, uh, where I was trying to be a responsible um, consultant psychiatrist, and in my night job when I was an irresponsible beer drinker. Uh, well, no, a very responsible beer drinker, but the two didn't go well together. And in fact, they, <laughs> it came to a head 
and persuaded me that something needed to be done. On the day that the first edition of Good Beer Guide Belgium and Holland came out, and copies of it were sent to the local newspapers, television station, radio station. On the same day, um, the alcohol uh, abuse policy for uh, my county came out. Uh, it was a, a publication uh, that was aimed at uh, obviously a very different audience, but it just so happened that I was the contact person for that document as well. And so all these regional media got two documents on the same day, one beer guide written by this guy and one anti-alcohol policy written by this guy with the same contact number. Uh, and the only reason we got away with it, and there wasn't a problem, was that in those days, uh, there were news desks and there were features desks and a book is a feature and an alcohol policy is news and the two never spoke to each other and so there wasn't a single organization that discovered what had happened but I knew <laughs> so so it shaped what I did and I I was therefore quite quiet about uh, what I was writing I didn't write anything about UK beer for about 20 years um, but I quietly worked away at the Belgian scene and did quite a lot of writing about Belgium. Yeah, yeah. And how do you find other authors to write books with? Uh, the practical things with that? Um, it's it, Beer writing is quite a small world. Uh, you have to be sociable. You have to go out and meet people. I was very pleased in the early days to meet uh, Peter Krombeck, who wrote Biersmaken and was the person who started uh, OBP, the Belgian Consumer Group. And uh, although Peter gave up sometime in the 90s, I think, uh, he was a really useful influence because he was somebody who thought about beer not just as a passion, but also in terms of categorizing it and uh, being able to put things into understandable blocks of stuff. Uh, that was really helpful. He also knew his stuff. Um, then you have to go out and you have to meet the professional journalists. And if you are somebody who is not by background a journalist, that can sometimes be difficult. But the more that things like Good Beer Guide Belgium got respect for the amount of research that had gone in and for how it was presented, the more it was easy to have conversations with what I call proper writers. And then as the years have gone by, the boundaries have blurred. Uh, I, I've won prizes for my writing, which I, I think is hilarious because it's my hobby. Uh, and I'm, But my understanding of the whole beer scene from all points of view has grown. And a lot of that has been coming from other writers uh, as well as being able to mix in uh, more and more exalted circles in the brewing industry, which has also been helpful. Yeah, but you keep focusing on the Belgium and the Netherlands uh, beer styles, correctly. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I certainly felt I was I was deliberately very Belgian focused, with some interest in the Netherlands uh, up until about 2010. And then I retir retired from my main job, and about six months later, I got a telephone call out of the blue from uh, Octopus Publishing, and they said, uh, "Would you like to? We, we, we want to produce a world atlas of beer. Uh, would you like to write it?" And I said no, <laughs> because I thought, you know, I've just retired. I don't want a really big job like that. In any case, it's just too much to write about. I couldn't think about it. Uh, so then the publishing director, who's still there, Denise Bates, uh, she gets on the phone to me and says, oh, look, what's the problem here? Um, because you don't, the way it works with writing is that you don't get approached to write something. You, 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 you have an idea, you pitch it to a publisher. The publisher says no, so you pitch it to another publisher, and another publisher says no, and then you change it a bit and you send it to another, and so on and so forth. And if you're lucky, you get to write a book. Um, this was the other way around. They, they pitched to me, and, and, and I said, uh, she said, what's the problem? I said, well, look, the problem is that um, the beers you want to write about you know, in a global atlas or in any book about beer are the ones that are made by small producers Generally, they are the interesting, unusual ones. And in real life, over 90% of the industry is run by large companies uh, like AB InBev, Heineken, 
and so on. Uh, and they don't. And she said, well, uh, and I wouldn't want to write about them. And she said, well, do they make any decent beer? And I said, no, not really, not very much. <laughs> uh, and then she said, so what's the problem? And I thought, this is a, you know, Octopus is part of the second largest publishing company in the world. And I thought, this is a, this company is seriously going to do a book about beer that isn't going to mention the AB InBevs and the Heinekens, and et cetera, of the world. I thought, I can do business with these people. This is, this is good. And then I had another thought, and I thought, oh, but I can't do it because I just got this too much. I can't do, um, the, I can't do the US, for example, which is a huge part of the story. And then my uh, delightful middle daughter said to me, because I was about to ring back and say, look, I still can't do it, sorry. And she said, Dad, um, how many people, when they retire, get offered their dream job? And I thought, mm, yeah, OK. Um, yeah, yeah, I kind of get that. And I scratched my head, and I went to sleep on it. And the next morning, I woke up, and I thought, I could do this. But I need another writer, particularly to do the US. And I'd met Steve Beaumont in 1996, I think, the first time, uh, purely by accident. Um, my oldest daughter lives in Canada. Uh, I'd been over to see her. Uh, she, she'd gone back home. I, um, I have a night on my own in Toronto. Uh, I find this bar called Smokeless Joe's. And it's a fantastic bar, great. And I'm talking to the guy who owns it, and he says, "Oh, you you should meet this guy who writes the Canadian beer guide." Uh, and he phoned him up. He happened to be available, and we met up, and we've been meeting up ever since. And I just suddenly thought, I know who could write the other half of this book, Steve Beaumont. So then we do the first edition of the World Atlas of Beer. We've then done a second one, and we've just completed the third one, which comes out in October. Um, which I think we both think is the best thing we've ever written. And uh, so it's, it's taken off from there. I considered myself a Belgian writer up till 2010. And now I know about most of what's going on in beer in the world. I wouldn't consider myself an expert on North America. That's Steve's area. Or Latin America. That is Steve's area. Um, or Australasia. That's Steve's area. But I've got a good idea of what's happening. And when it comes to being able to give an overview of what's happening overall, I, I consider myself to be in a very privileged position because I get to see a lot of material. And because I travel a lot, I get to try it as well, which, is, which helps. Yes, yes. <laughs> a cool job. Um, <laughs> what do you think um, Belgian beer styles will be more popular? Belgian beer styles? Brewed by non-Belgian brewers, or the Belgian beer as a brand outside Belgium. I, th I think I think it's I think it is important for Belgian brewing to understand that Belgian beer is a brand, uh, and I know that there are brewers in Belgium who get that, uh, and, and also the brand is not Stellar Artois and Jupiter. The brand is um, other beer styles. For for me the. Be a revival of the last uh, 40 years, 50 years maybe. Uh, people think it's about the growing number of breweries. They think it's about the growing number of different beers. They think it's about this country, that country starting to brew beer. It's not. The core, the one central thing that will be its legacy and will, I think, change brewing forever is this huge range of beer styles that has grown up and developed in the last 20 years in particular. And that is key to Belgium. Belgium was responsible for that having still existed back in the 1970s. And I think Belgian brewers are naturally very good at making new beer styles. And they're also not too hung up on the idea that you have to call them something. Um, they are, they're good at developing types of beer that don't have a name until somebody in some other country calls it something. And, and so I think Belgian brewing will continue to influence the world. I think it's seen as the home of craft beer in many ways. I, I call it the mothership. And um, that's, that's, that's a good role. When, when it, the interesting thing about other countries trying to imitate Belgian beer styles is that they're often not very good at doing it. And then when they do get good at doing it, 
they've, they've often done something else. And there's a great example of this, which is the Belgian style ales of the US, which initially were incredibly simple. What they were based on was that the, um, the, the yeast laboratories over there had developed a few strains of yeast that were able to spice up beers add a spicy flavor to them. And it's, it's similar to what the German wheat beer brewers do with their banana yeasts and yeasts that give clove flavors. Well, they had a sort of generalized Belgian spiciness could be put into any beer if you used yeast numbers 1536 to 1539. Now, you take spin this forward 20, 30 years because a lot of Belgian brewers were very sniffy about um, this shortcut yeast. Uh, and rightly so, I think. The, now you find Belgian brewers use those yeast as well. And they've started to play with them to do yeast changes to beers, which they then Belgianize in one way or another. So uh, it's, it's a complicated relationship has developed between different countries. Belgium is hugely respected in the brewing industry all around the world. Craft brewers uh, always speak positively about uh, the Belgian heritage for craft beer. And I think this will continue for a long time to come, provided people don't mess it up. Yeah. Is um, uh, me as a Belgian, is Belgium too shy to promote his beer and its quality uh, outside his borders compared to, let's say, the people from the Netherlands? I think, well, that's an interesting point because you can argue it the other way. Um, I think. There is a natural reticence uh, in Belgian companies to be very Belgian. Um, however, in the brewing industry, I think it, that's changed, certainly changing, probably changed. Um, it's quite a cachet to be a Belgian-based company. Um, and if you look at craft beer in particular, although the Dutch beer scene has been advancing very fast, very successfully, uh, so it's been very exciting. Um, there's not a lot of export going on from the Netherlands to other parts of the world. Um, it, it's not the worst example in Europe. I think, that, I think the quietest craft brewers in Europe are probably the Danes. The amount of Danish beer, the properly Danish beer that gets outside of Denmark that comes from craft producers uh, is very small. You, you'll see Mikkeler and um, Tull and, and other companies like that, but that's all made in Belgium anyway. So, um, but the, the, uh, the Danes are very reticent to speak about their beers, not very confident to export them, are very good. Belgians, I think, 20, 30 years ago, you, um, well, anyway, I take another time scale. In the 1970s, before Michael Jackson started writing, there was, you would not see beer mentioned in textbooks about the Belgian economy. Uh, it wasn't seen as one of the big Belgian things. Nowadays, uh, textbooks about the Belgian economy always mention beer, and 70%, I think, is exported. Uh, so it's 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 a nuanced um, it's a nuanced issue. It's 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 complex, but uh, uh, there certainly should be pride. Yeah. What do you think is one of the bigger mistakes Belgian brewers or? Belgium as a beer country does? Oh, I think currently it's one big thing, uh, which is the law about uh, who can and cannot call themselves a brewer or brewery. Uh, one of the most embarrassing things you, you, you've got now you've got Belgian beer is um, it has this status even with UNESCO that it's an, an intangible, I've forgotten the t term, but it's an intangible part of the world culture or something. Um, it's a hugely, it's a huge honor. And, um, and yet about half the companies that are called breweries, uh, don't actually own a brewery. Uh, they don't, uh, they have other people brew for them. And while some of those companies are just on the way to getting a brewery, and some of your best modern brewers started off that way, and it's a very honorable, sensible course to take. Uh, I still think it's wrong that any company can, call, can say, describe themselves as a brewery if they don't own and use their own kit. Uh, and it would be a very simple thing to change. In Finland, um, the system is that if you don't own a brewery, 
you can only call yourself a wholesaler. You can't call yourself a brewery. Uh, and more to the point, you don't get any of the subsidies for brewery companies. So it is something that can be legislated for very simply. And if it did that, I think the whole Bel what, the one thing that's wrong currently with the Belgian Act uh, would be cleaned up in an instant. So I'd love to see that happen. Uh, I mean, I think there have been other errors of judgment over the years, but those are being sorted out. It's um, it strikes me as a very uh, otherwise a very healthy and vibrant uh, part of the Belgian economy and of the brewing world. Yeah. Where do you think that we are now on the hype terrain of craft beer? Um, I, I think it, it's certainly true to say that the word craft has marketed that part of the new world of beer that is responsible for beer taking off again as a, uh, a desirable commodity. People haven't really followed this particularly well, but since beer went all boring in the um, 1960s, 70s, 80s, uh, Actually, the core markets for beer have gone off it. They, 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 they slowly but surely dropped. And it's un unsurprising. Beer wasn't particularly entertaining. It was becoming a commodity. Everything was 5% alcohol, frothy top blown lagers, not tasting of a lot. Um, so people went off it. And anybody who was interested in um, drinks that tasted of something, uh, like my parents, for example, uh, they moved to wine. Um, so beer went boring. When craft came along, I mean, we, we, we saw the microbreweries come along. We saw some revival of heritage breweries a little bit. Uh, but it didn't really take off until this word craft came along, which I claim is a Belgian word. I, th I think the first, first earliest we've spotted the word craft beer is in a Michael Jackson text from 1977. And he was simply translating bière artisanale and uh, artisanal beer from from Dutch and that was supposed to be French and Dutch. I apologize for my accent. Um, he translated that to mean craft beer. And then the word suddenly takes off sometime in the 1990s. Um, it's become a very popular word because it's a shorthand for everything that's good about beer. However, it's imprecise. And it would be, it has no definition. But on the other hand, there are many circumstances in which it would be helpful to define better beer using a simple term. And so the word, the term craft beer could be used and can be used to identify a type of beer, collective type of beer, for one particular purpose. For example, um, uh, giving um, tax breaks or excise breaks for small companies that are pr producing jobs in the brewing industry, because the big brewers don't produce jobs. The big brewers cut jobs. That's that's one of their job. One of their purposes is to cut jobs to make things efficient. Whereas small breweries create jobs because everything has to be done more carefully. And so, as far as the economy is concerned, small breweries much better. Large breweries. Mm. Um, so to, to single out the smaller breweries that are producing better beer, to use the word craft will be helpful, but you have to have a different definition in each time you use it. Yeah. Uh, to go into more the economics of beer a bit, um, we now had the first wave of uh, the COVID pandemic. <laughs> we had a lockdown. <laughs> we were seeing uh, a bit of I lockdown. noticed. <laughs> uh, what is what is the impact on that on smaller brewers? Um, will there will there be sorted out? I will be very interested to see. Um, I think I understand most of the pressures that are in there. I. Th given a lot of thought to it uh, in the last few weeks because I've been involved in quite a few things that are about uh, challenging the future of beer uh, that people have had time to think about during lockdown. And I, I confidently say from my position of having lots of knowledge that I haven't a clue what's going to happen. Uh, I think it can go one of many ways. 
But what I will say is that here in Bristol, which is we have in Bristol, we have either 18 or 19 breweries, actual breweries with kit uh, in the city. And the city within the city boundary, there's only 450,000 people here. Um, but 19 breweries, it's not bad. They're all as small and independent. And the attitude to the brewing has been very different from the rest of the country. Here, people have been mobilizing their home delivery networks, which they didn't have before. I know there's one brewery that's producing more beer than before the lockdown. There are stories from around the UK of some other breweries that are like that. The US, um, a lot of the craft breweries are working very hard to maintain their positions, and some are doing quite well. Um, we've even had a brewery open during lockdown uh, near, <laughs> near us here. Other breweries have just stopped. And um, it's, uh, it's difficult to see how, what's going to happen afterwards. But what I, the way I see it is this. The thing that was fundamentally changing over the last 20 years is that ordinary customers were starting to like the products of new small breweries a lot. Uh, they were getting quite enthusiastic about it and the types of beer that only small breweries can produce. Uh, customers, by and large, were still going off industrial lager, brand name lagers, slowly. I'm not sure why that should change after the lockdown ends. Um, I don't, uh, there was a second issue. The, the people who are trained brewers working in these small breweries. There weren't enough of them. Whichever country you look at, there simply aren't enough trained brewers, either degree level brewers or people who've learned their trade through working in lots of other companies, etc. There simply weren't enough of them. Um, and that was a, an issue with quality a lot of the time. All those people who started um, in the brewing, who were in the brewing trade in, uh, in March, most of them are still going to be alive and still functioning and still wanting a job as a brewer. Uh, at, after the lockdown ends, they're still going to be out there. And I, I think it would take an idiot not to employ them. And the third factor is that if you look at the investors, the people who are putting money into the brewing industry, uh, they have to ask themselves, what are you going to invest in? Are you going to invest in the large lager companies producing commodity beers as cheaply as possible for people who care less about what they drink? Or are you going to invest in the sector which was growing? Uh, and producing small-scale beers of broadly different styles that were enthusing younger people whose spending power will be there for the next 50 years. And to me, it's a no-brainer that you don't invest in the old ways because they were failing. And they're not going to stop failing after this COVID-19. My only fear, and the only thing I have about this negative about the future is if, as a result of this period of not drinking so much, not doing so much, the overall uh, beer market falls. I think that's more of a problem. And also, if the retail market for on sales, the cafes, the bars, the pubs, the restaurants, if that's badly hit, that's again a, another medium term issue. But overall, I think good beer is going to do better than industrial beer uh, within a few years of now, whatever happens with COVID. Okay, so interesting. You say that the big brewers are more failing in terms of growth than the small crafter brewers. It, yeah, it's uh, there. You could easily get spokesmen for the big brewing industry on who would say that's wrong, and they'd show you various numbers. Uh, and the thing with the numbers is that there's been this. Sleight of hand has been happening for many years because uh, big brand lagers are growing in countries where they have never never been available before across Africa, parts of Asia. Uh, it was a few years back Eastern Europe. Um, the numbers appear to go up, but if you look at the underlying trend, there is a couple of percent a year fall off in the overall consumption of what I call industrial lagers. Uh, it's a shorthand for you know, mm. e quick, quick, you know what I mean. Um, and that's interesting. And that is reflected in the overall beer market fairing. And I don't think anybody in the large companies 
actually seriously disagrees with it. That, 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 that we, we got to a stage just before COVID, or about a year ago, we got to a stage where it was possible to say to people in both large and small breweries, look, the world works like this. The brand beer is dependent on the small breweries for its sexiness, for its appeal, and for all those areas of growth that there are out there. It all comes down to what the small brewers are doing. So you, big brewers, are actually very dependent on the small brewers. And you small brewers, on the other hand, you don't get access to market because all over Europe, there are these, um, there's this traditional exemption in the, for the beer market uh, that in most other trades would probably be seen as a restriction of trade and the EU and other governments would be trying to get rid of it. But it still exists in brewing. And, it, it, and the bottom line from that is that small brewers don't get the same right to sell their beers as large brewers because the large brewers in one way or form have bought into the uh, the retail side, the supermarket side, the bar side, etc., with with all sorts of deals. Um, so, uh, yeah, I kind of lost track of what I was saying there because I, I've, I've got on from one of my big issues at the moment, which is you must get small brewers into the market. Oh, that's right. The two are interdependent. Small brewers depend on large brewers to be allowed into the market. Large brewers depend on small brewers to keep beer sexy. And COVID came along at a time when it was just starting to get interesting what the small and the large were starting to do together, because the large ones must allow the small ones to make a living and to make a good living. And the small ones must get realistic about who's actually in charge of the market. And uh, COVID's been rather unfortunate in getting in the way of that, but um, hey-ho, the way of it. And the last couple of years we see more and more the trend that uh, big brewers buy a small craft brewer for the sexiness of the image how do you look well the brand business? name is what they want yeah yeah i mean they, they, it's it's the way the thing i've grown up and lived in an era when we all thought that big business knew what it was doing and we've had huge respect for um, people who've, who've developed businesses, become very large businesses. And we've kind of assumed that the way it was done was the correct way. When you stand back from it, there's lots of parts of how big business grew that are just not very helpful for normal people. Um, my favorite example, I've given already, my favorite example is, is big businesses that grow by sacking people and getting fewer people and more machines to do the work. Well, that kind of works for the company balance sheet. It doesn't really work for normal human beings or for countries or societies um, where you've really got to give people jobs else they get hellish bored and they start becoming very unhelpful. They do things like voting for Brexit. And, and, and you, you, I didn't say that. I, never, I promised never to use the word Brexit again. But um, you get my drift. If you exclude ordinary people, from their own societies by saying you can't have meaningful jobs. You're not doing something helpful. Whereas if you employ them in small companies that on the balance sheet are less efficient, the very thing that makes them less efficient often produces a better product and also gives people jobs. And so I think we do need to start questioning how we run countries and societies and communities in a much bigger way. Um, and that, that's going to be interesting to see how that pans out. I've forgotten your question. <laughs> <laughs> if a, a big brewer uh, buys a small craft brewer... Uh, oh, that's right. Yes, I knew we started somewhere logical. My brain works in funny ways, especially during lockdown. Um, yeah, I mean, from a very cynical, skeptical view is that the only reason that um, uh, large breweries buy small breweries is to get themselves brand names to put on their sales lists. And then when they use their con restrictive contracts with bars or supermarkets or whatever, they've got a small number of sexy sounding craft like beers that they can sell as well. And I think that's pretty accurate. Um, the, uh, the trouble is that those brands very often 
change quite swiftly. There's a very good example. I, I don't know whether to mention it or, or by name, but um, if I put it in the usual provisos that this is my personal opinion and it may be entirely wrong. Um, but when Heineken took over Lagunitas, Lagunitas uh, beers were a very, they were pretty good. And I remember thinking at the time, if they keep Lagunitas IPA exactly where it is, don't change its production at all. Just just keep trying to produce the same old thing. That sets a really interesting challenge to the craft brewing sector. Uh, because in order to get an IPA into bars, you'd have to make something that was as good as or slightly different from, but you know, as good as or better than Lagunitas IPA. That sets the bar much higher. And then as far as I can taste. And I have some supportive evidence for this. Uh, they, they kind of they changed the hopping. And why would you do that? And they didn't change it for the better; they changed it for the worse. And you've want, you've now got a much more approachable, not particularly standout, perfectly decent, but nowhere near as good IPA with lots of exposure. And I felt that was really stupid. Now, apologies to Heineken if that's not what's happened, but. I say that's what I taste, and 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 it's this obsession with very large breweries. They must cut costs, cut costs, because that's what it says in business school. Um, and when you're dealing with something consumable, that logic is not actually very good. Um, cutting costs and being able to make something just as well, when it comes to consumables. Is quite a good trick. There are certain things you could do which don't come. Uh, I mean, if you go to a brewery that goes, for example, if your brewery goes from eight hours a day, five days a week to 24 7 production, it is possible that you can make exactly the same quality stuff, but more of it and your overheads go down a bit so you can save a bit of money. With most other things that change the contents of that consumable thing, it's a really risky thing to do. And the finance people should be told, no, you can't change it. Nothing to do with you. We, the people who make it, are uh, telling you that it's going to go down in quality. And so we're right, you're wrong. Yeah. Work your numbers some other way. I recently talked with Richard from Black Donkey Brewing. And he said, also, my bookkeeper never sees my beer recipes. So yep. that's something in big companies where they always go over, use less of this and this to cut the cost. That's like that, or? Yeah, Steve, Steve and I have a, a, when we go around and we, we get around quite a lot, we do quite a lot of touring together. Um, I certainly do this all the time and I, it, it's come from discussions we've had. The, the, the brewers that do really well, the new, new startup brewers that do really well, have an understanding of how to brew. They know it backwards. They have an understanding of how money works. And they have an understanding of how to how to get a beer into the market. They have those three talents. It's often quite important that those three talents are in, or it's often inevitable that those three talents will be in three different people. But where that is the case, they have to be really disciplined that when someone is in their specialist area, they make the decision. And it's uh, I think it's one of the key things to being a success is firstly to have those three talents, and secondly that the talent the talent about that area always works. And when, if you've got an issue where the brewer says I want to do this, and the marketing guy says I can't get that beer into the market because uh, of this, that, and the other reason, they just have to sort of sort it out uh, amicably as possible and come to the right conclusion. Uh, where it clashes, it has to be sorted out. But though you, you've got to have those three talents. And in the large breweries, it saddens me how low down the pecking order the brewers have become. And while it is that case, I can't see them in the long term doing as well as they should do. Yeah. Could do. Yeah, that's cool. Um, that was a bit. Camera uh, now in the UK is one of the bigger. Uh, consumer organizations. How do you see in other European countries uh, beer consuming organizations rise? 
Well, it's interesting. The uh, camera started it all back in 1971. Uh, Pint in the Netherlands came along in 1981. Uh, I think OBP was the original Belgian one in 1983. Uh, it's still expanding. The numbers are still expanding. Um, some organizations go under, but usually another organization comes along in the same country. Um, some of the organizations are small and struggling, um, get by from month to month. Others are really quite large with some thousands of people. There are even examples of, of organizations that are very small, but because of the way they're organized, they get an enormous amount of work done. Um, I think the difficulty is that uh, for young people in particular, you say, well, why do you want to be in an organization? Um, and the idea of turning up to an organization that has meetings and then it has committees and it has this, that, and the other is completely unappealing to uh, younger people. But some of the consumer groups now are working to models where it's much more uh, like a social media based, but able to harvest information and use it and the f it, it, it getting people to focus on the idea that the bottom line job is you need to influence the brewing industry in your country you need to influence some politicians in your country and of course it has to operate at an eu wide or europe wide level so it's getting that stuff organized that is the complicated bit but really you can start a consumer group anywhere provided that you've got half a dozen people who understand how the world works and understand what is the job of beer consumers to put across to the people who actually are in charge of what happens in brewing. Uh, and if you've got that, it's, it's, it's good. It's, it's, it's interesting that Europe is virtually unique in having these groups. There's, there's one in New Zealand uh, and there's some funny things happening in the US right now where um, I think some consumer groups might come through, but it's a very European thing. Um, but then I think we have a different type of democracy and we have a different type of relationship between government and large business. And there's perhaps more opportunities for consumerism to, to show itself. But I think it's a very important part of the beer world and it could be a lot more important. Do you think there is too much lobbying of big um, beer industry firms on a European level for legislation not to be changed? Or is it that smaller consumers are not organized enough to push the change? I think uh, certainly there is an onus on consumer groups to get more effective and efficient. Uh, a lot of that is about learning how things work. Uh, some of it is quite simple about how to change organizations into being um, structurally what the system requires. You have to be, um, <coughs> certain ways in which you have to be registered as a lobbyist. Uh, it's, I think it's fair to say certainly at the EU level and in, in most governments, they are very refreshed by seeing a group of people who are only there because of enthusiasm and interest. They, governments often spend, or go, governments, civil servants, politicians spend a lot of their time being lobbied by people on behalf of commercial interests. Uh, and it's a relief to come along and have people who are relatively independent from that. Um, but if I was running a very large brewery company, I'd want to have my talons into everywhere. I would use tactics that are above board and uh, open, and I'd have other disruption techniques trying to get in there everywhere in, in government and in the trade and all the rest of it. And then that's what I would expect from them because I think that's, that's the game. But don't underestimate the guile and the power and the um, uh, inventiveness of large companies to protect uh, very large profits that are increasingly made for individuals rather than shareholders. Yeah. Also, if you look to uh, the countries in Europe, um, there is different laws saying you cannot uh, sell alcohol online and stuff. Is that something you think that Europe should intervene in to make a European law to sort of that? I, I don't know. Uh, I can't really comment on that because I, I, I don't 
that, that's a matter for national governments to talk to the European government about and work out what they think is fair. I would say in general about there, there is a legacy of some very bizarre beliefs about alcohol um, that needs to be challenged. Uh, one of the most, there, there, well, there's a couple of countries where there's some really interesting things happening. Um, Poland considers it has a major problem with alcohol misuse. Uh, and I'll, I'll take them at their word for that. Let's say that's correct. There's recently been a significant increase in the amount of beer drunk, but the amount of alcohol being drunk has fallen. And what you're actually seeing is people shifting away from uh, heavy spirits drinking, uh, moving towards beer instead, with an overall reduction in consumption of alcohol. And that's quite interesting. Uh, a lot of the beliefs that are behind the European policies uh, are that all alcohol is bad for you. And this is something that's been drilled into people by the temperance movement and the prohibitionists. And well, nowadays they call themselves health campaigners, but some of the biggest organizations in health campaigning around alcohol are funded by the organization that used to be called the temperance movement. And so it's, it's, it's a big, big old fashioned lobbying exercise. But I think if, if we move towards more intelligent government, there are some interesting things that can be done. And with regard to alcoholic beverages, this move towards drinking better quality alcohol, causing people to drink less quantity, uh, would be very interesting. Um, I, th I think the online stuff is just silly, really. Um, it's, 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 it, but it, it survives because of traditional prejudices about alcohol drinking. Yeah. Um I remember also the talk of the Europeans brewer. <coughs> Pardon, <laughs> sorry. Um, I also remember the talk um, at the European Brewer Forum, the holy grail of finding a low or non-alcoholic beer. Do you consider that as the holy grail? No. <laughs> I think I no. I think the, re the reason they're all getting all terribly upset about it is I think maybe everyone's Coca Cola to buy them, um, but the or else to go into going to the soft drinks market. The the um, the, the thing about non alcoholic beer is it's a great concept, uh, but and I've said I've said this to people from the largest to the smallest. Uh, non alcoholic beer will be competing with soft drinks. And it will also be competing with beer. So not only does it have to be uh, a beery alternative to Coca-Cola, it also has to be uh, a decent enough beer. And I think it will take off if they develop not only um, good tasting zero alcohol beers, and there are few enough of those around. There are a few. There are a few. There are certain techniques you can use that can get the best out of hops. Um, preserve the grain base and all the rest of it, but it's complicated. But I think you've got to actually make a type of beer that is distinctive within the beer category. So that when somebody picks it up and drinks it, they think, oh, right, okay, that must be a, 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 a zero alcohol beer because it has these positive flavors in it. Um, the ones that have been developed so far are, well, it's almost like our brand name beer. You can hardly tell that it's not no alcohol in it which are, frankly is not good enough. Um, the, uh, or it's, it's sort of, or they're, they're beers that haven't been made properly. They're, they're, they're made from wort that has not been fermented properly. And, and they all miss the spot. You've got, I think there is potential to make probably a, a hoppily distinctive, um, or get a, balance, a gallant balance kind of behind a grainy flavor in the hops in a particular way that makes the whole style of non-alcoholic, low-alcoholic beer is quite distinctive. You know, maybe three, three or four different styles. But until that's correct, I just see this as the greatest idea since lunchtime. Yeah. And do you think that during COVID also the demand of cheaper beer will be rising? We're not talking about industrial lager, but more accessible, cheaper craft beers? It's, it's very difficult to see what's actually happening, but what little data there is suggests otherwise. People, people uh, some of the UK data is suggesting that people are perfectly happy to pay more for beer temporarily, uh, provided it's good. Um, I think if you're going to try and sell 
um, the broadly rather tasteless brands at higher prices, people aren't going to buy that, um, and nor should they. The, they're, they're very cheap to make anyway. They're relatively most, most industrial lagers are relatively expensive compared to how much it costs to make them. Um, and I think pushing the profit margins even higher is just wrong. Um, but I think it's, it, I don't know. It, it, my instinct is that it will help people to think about what beers they drink more than they otherwise would do. I know locally around here, we've been fortunate enough to be able to push the idea that there are 15 breweries in, 14 or 15 breweries in Bristol still functioning, all doing home delivery to the, to the local city. Um, I think that's probably been quite helpful. Um, I'm just seeing and hearing online people talking about breweries, who, local breweries who, who I know uh, were saying that they normally drink big brand name beers. So there's something happening. Whether that will be a lasting effect, whether it'll be a big effect, I really don't know. So yeah, I'm, I'm moving in my, I've lost you. I've lost you. Uh, hello. Hello. Yeah, yes. you're back. All right. Um, other okay. question. You already mentioned your uh, new edition of the World Atlas of Beer. Um, what can we expect in terms of uh, trends that are popping up there? We, we've been um, trying to write a book about, that encapsulates the whole of brewing in the world when beer has moved so far in the last 15 years in particular. Uh, it's quite a challenge. For the, for the, well, the first one we did was in 2000, we wrote it in 2011, that came out in 2012. And we looked at each other afterwards and said, my God, we managed to get something done. You know, it's, it is actually possible to get it all in one book. And then we spent the next three years learning about everything we'd missed out. So last time we did it and we thought, my God, so much has changed. It was really a challenge. And this time we sat down right at the very beginning and we said, look, we, you can no longer do these are the best beers in the world. Firstly, because that concept is a nonsense anyway. And secondly, because there's just too many excellent beers out there. You've got to do it in a different way. So the book's changed in so far as what we're really doing is we're saying, this is the background to beer. This is a bit about the history where it came from, but looking actually at the proper influences rather than just the well-known ones. Uh, this is where beer is at right now in lots of different ways, looking at both the industry and the type of beer that's available and how it's spread around the world. You know, the big trending stuff is it's spread around the world. We, we first edition 35 countries we spotted have got a beer culture uh, to speak of. Second edition, probably nudging up around 60. Uh, today, the number of brew countries that have got more than one brewery producing uh, what can broadly be called craft beer, about 120 countries. Uh, and it's spreading around the rest of the world. It's going basically everywhere except the Islamic world. Um, and that's phenomenal. Uh, but then you look at the changes to beer styles, etc. And uh, we've been pretty candid. Um, we introduce people to the different beer styles of the world uh, and their variations, and we talk about what's happening in all the different countries. But you have to think, <clears throat> these beers that have got way too much sugar in them, the so-called sweet shop beers, these beers that have got way too much cloudiness in them, um, you know what I mean. Uh, and these beers that are made by showing a bunch of acid or, or taking some of the beer out, making it acidic, putting it back in and then doing it. Are they really any good? I mean, does it really do any beer a favor by the putting cordial in them just before you put them in a can? Um, I really, yeah. We, anyway, we'll see what people think about that. We'd be quite rude about certain types of craft beer. Uh, but on the other hand, you've still got to celebrate the enormous changes to the brewing world that are, um, have happened. And I think probably the most useful thing for a lot of people in this book will be just to see how far it's all gone. Um, and if you're my age, it just helps you planning where you're going to go around the world uh, once we're allowed out the front door. Yeah. Uh, do you have any concrete plans already for uh, <laughs> trips? 
Well, I had, I, look, I've got, just allow me to have a little bit of a moan, will you? The, the, um, <laughs> before the lockdown, something was happening to my career as a beer writer that was very, very good. And I had promised a trip to Australia, flying there, lying down class. You know, this is really good. Similarly, a trip to West Coast US. I was on a promise for Brazil. I got a pl trip planned to India. I was also going to South Africa. So, you know, all the, all the beer drinking continents. And that's without thinking about my, uh, the, uh, I got a plan to go from Oslo to Bamberg by train. I was doing two, I was doing another book on how to travel around Europe uh, to the best beer spots. And all of that went out the window. However, it does mean I've got so many promises of where <laughs> for next year <laughs> that I think I'm pro I'll be lucky if I ever see the inside of this flat for the for the whole of 2020. I think or the whole of 2021. Um, but hey, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, uh, Tim Webb. Uh, final question. If you have to explain uh, craft beer to a 10 year old, how would you do that? <laughs> uh, let me let me duck this question. Um, <laughs> I, it's when I was seven years old. I went on holiday. Uh, it was the first, just about the first holiday I remember. Uh, my parents. Uh, we went on a cruise, and on this cruise, we met uh, this family where the two sons were more or less my age. One was one year older, one was one year younger. And uh, their family had just sold their family brewery. And the granddad, who I can still remember, uh, had got a glass of frosted lager in front of him. And he gave it to me and he said, son, when you grow up, that's what you're going to be drinking. And I remember not knowing what he meant at the time. and 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 asking my parents who, you know, they, they remembered too. And they, uh, and I tasted it and I thought, oh my God, that's disgusting. Uh, which is why, no, I don't think that anymore. Uh, nowadays, I think it's just boring. But I think I would just be, I, I, I don't know how I'd explain craft beer to I think it's beer made by ordinary people. Uh, no, I don't know. I'll st I, Dan Shelton's definition is a craft beer is something in the heart of the brewer. And for me, I think it is that it's the, the people who can genuinely say they are craft brewers are people who are concerned first and foremost about the flavor of the beer they produce. Uh, but I think if you said to a 10 year old, craft beer is just beer that's brewed for the flavor, um, not the profitability. I think most 10 year olds would look at you like you had a clue what they were talking about. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Some very nice last words. Thank you, Tim <laughs> Webb, for having you. And see Thanks, you Peter. In Belgium. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I enjoy having a beer with you. <laughs> <All right. laughs> okay. Cheers. <laughs>